Creed was a 2015 film directed by Ryan Coogler. This was his second team up in a row with Michael B. Jordan with a third on the horizon, so get ready for everyone to be calling these the Michael B. Jordan trilogy. Creed is an excellent screenplay courtesy of Coogler and real life friend Aaron Covington, someone whose only other writing credit is mystifyingly NBA 2K17's My Career Mode, but his acting credits are twice as long as his writing ones, but 40 times as weird, so let's just call it a drop. It stars the aforementioned Michael B. Jordan as a Adonis Creed, Tessa Thompson, who rules 24-7, thanks for asking, plays Bianca, and Sylvester Stallone returns to the role that launched his career as Rocky Balboa. It's important to understand that Rocky was a script that Sylvester Stallone, yes, that one, wrote in three days, which was just one of the three times in his career he was nominated for an Academy Award. Twice for the original Rocky for original screenplay and lead actor. Awards he lost to Network both times, which, yeah, okay, that tracks. His third nomination was for this movie 39 years later, an award he lost to Mark Rylance for Bridge of Spies, and I personally would have given it to Sloan for this because I don't think he's ever put on a performance that was even in the ballpark of this one. I think when talking about story, it's important to revel in the nuances of a particular piece because like Gordon Ramsay, the flavor is in the subtext. And sometimes it's pretty raw. This movie is about boxing after all, so perhaps the best place to begin is conflict. <laughs> When you break this film down to its simplest parts, it's difficult to find material painting with this particular brush. We open in a juvenile correction facility where we meet young Adonis, our protagonist known to most as just Donnie. But all things being equal, Michael B. Jordan is stacked like a Christmas ham in this movie, so he definitely lives up to the whole Adonis thing. As we are introduced to the troubled Donnie, a boy who never knew his father because he died in a Vegas punch fight with an aptly named Russian Terminator, Drago. He is just learning to fight in the toughest environment a kid could experience. So we as the audience are like, oh I get it, that's how he gets tough. But not so fast, my sultry friends. We are then introduced to Felicia Rashad's character, Mary Ann Creed, formerly the wife of Adonis' father, Apollo Creed, but Mary Ann is very much not his mother. She's just a good-ass person who happens to have inherited some chunk of Apollo Creed's vast wealth, and she adopts Adonis. This is the first really interesting wrinkle of the film to me. Adonis spends a majority of his life in the lap of luxury. We go from rags to riches to still riches but sort of pretending to be from rags which is why you're so afraid to mention that your dad is one of if not the best athlete of all time in the exact sport you are competing in a particular type of plot that i don't think shakespeare really ever told in any of his plays and this particular disconnect is one of the most interesting driving forces behind adonis it makes him a contradiction he resents his dad for making a decision that meant he wasn't going to be there when he was growing up which is a perfectly understandable emotional state to be in. But his dream is to be a fighter, which was 100% directly responsible for why his own life went off the rails and why he was mad at his dad in the first place. He gained the wealth but lost a dad. He owes both everything he has and everything he lost to a man he never met because this man died doing the very thing that Donnie desperately has to do. It puts a lot of his central conflict onto whether or not he will take the name of Creed instead of Johnson, Mary Ann's maiden. And if he takes that on, does he deserve it? And even then, can he live up to it? There are many win states and many lose states for our hero, and each one of these states exists at a different level of success or failure. But interestingly, and this is a boxing movie, literally zero things hang in the balance of whether Adonis wins or loses the big fight at the end. None. Zero. All of our characters' conflict is contained within themselves. That particular wrinkle is not a stranger to the Rocky films, where lots of them come to a conclusion that is rarely neat or tidy. Hell, the last movie resolved all of its conflict with the idea that some people need to see how much punishment they can take as they stare into the vacuous void vexing our virulent vibe. To look the grim specter of death in the face and say, I am. It was an oddly subtle, existential meanderance played with all the subtlety of a jackhammer, and I think that is what is so incredible about what Kugler and company pulled off here. 
They took an incredibly not subtle world and characters and found every ounce of nuance within them, which internalizes our conflict. Everyone gives some pressure to the idea that Adonis is going to follow in the footsteps of his father Apollo, but no one ever stands in the way of it. In fact, by the end, everyone is cheering for him. You see this guy here staring back at you? Yeah. That's your toughest opponent. Our greatest conflict is ourselves. The biggest threat is the one staring back at you in the mirror. Marianne fights the demon she buried in the closet that killed her husband. We'll get to Rocky's in a minute. Adonis battles the tumultuous anger that riles inside of him like a furnace. And Bianca battles eventual hearing loss while being a full-time musician and also a slightly underwritten part. She does a lot with not a lot, and I think that was by design. I call this a sequel. It follows a different main character than the other six movies, but it gives that same main character the absolute inseparably beating heart of this film. They even have a creed. I fight, you fight. Two sides to a coin. Both fighters' goals would be obliterated almost instantly if not for the sacrifices of the other. Here's the Morty's mind blower. This film is a direct sequel to Rocky IV. Of all of the Rocky films, it bore fruit from one of the goofiest ones. More amazingly, there is no way this would have worked without that connection. In a weird way, this makes Rocky IV have a lot more weight and turn Creed into more of a contradiction than it already is. Creed is so good, it makes Rocky better. There are so many beautiful little nods, but they are nods to people that are no longer there. Adrian was already deceased in the last movie, Polly, Mickey, everybody's gone. And the Rocky Balboa story is not afraid to give finality to these characters that we loved on screen, but now literally everyone Rocky knew is gone. The son of the man you called brother is standing there asking you to step back into the ring as his trainer. Sure, Rocky resists at first, but when he realizes this isn't some opportunistic slug lord, that this is a real reason to be alive, he agrees to be his trainer. And because Creed is very much a part of the Rocky legacy, this fact starts to follow both of them around. Rocky already went out on top with the last one, so this needs to be something special, something deserving of another film. In more literal terms, the last movie ended really well and gave a nice, simple send-off to the character. The legacy of Rocky Balboa haunts the characters in this film as much as the idea of people making another Rocky film at all. And smartly, Coogler made a Creek film that also happens to be a Rocky film. It is both Creed 1 and Rocky 7. All at the same time being that their plot lines are given equal due credit within the story. In the end, what it offers to the legacy of Rocky elevates the entire lot of it. Even you, Rocky V, because we can see the regret of the film plastered across Stallone's face in nearly every scene. And Creed does a rare thing that sequels rarely manage to pull off. It gives depth and nuance to things you thought you already had a pretty good grasp on. It deepens our world. I mean, the first conversation between Adonis and Rocky is about a secret third fight that took place between Apollo and Rocky, deepening our understanding of their relationship. Rocky is actually all too happy to announce that he lost that secret third fight to Apollo. Which, not to pin too big of a ribbon on the scene, but it is definitely actively teaching an audience that this isn't actually about who wins and who loses. It's about what you give to it. That's the Rocky legacy to me, and this film nails it. After the final fight, everybody walks away happy. There are no losers. Because again, Rocky was never really about the boxing. It was about the people who happened to be fighters. And we happened to come along for the ride. Sure, boil it down to its potato innards and all the Rocky films are about sweaty boys beating the sweet innocuous tar out of each other. But if you lose the nuance of, for example, why this particular man chose to be a fighter, it's not about people beating each other up. It's about why people would choose to do that, a thing an audience pays an ungodly amount of money to see where you are openly risking and courting brain damage, something Rocky canonically already has. Because whatever we're out to prove, it starts by proving it to ourselves, and Adonis has a lot to prove, starting with a legacy that exists both inside the film's narrative world and outside of it in our corporeal real one. This had to stand beside the other Rocky movies, and from my perspective, now towers over them, but in a kind, nurturing way. Which brings us to...
An important element to keep in mind is that Ryan Coogler wasn't born until after Rocky IV had already come out. But when he was a kid, his dad would always make him watch Rocky movies because to him, Rocky was a father-son story because he had always experienced this through that lens. It is no surprise to me why Ryan would then turn Rocky into a father-son story, but it is very much about the struggle of both of these characters and the people around them that it affects. In 2011, as Ryan was finishing film school at UFC, his dad was diagnosed with a rare neurological disorder that took away his ability to walk. He wanted to do right by his dad, and with no pull in Hollywood, no name, and no real plan, he started writing with his friend Aaron. Yeah, NBA 2K17 Aaron, that Aaron. Yeah, go Aaron. I'm just here for Aaron. But Ryan somehow got in the room with Sly, the 69-year-old man who up to this point had written all six of the Rocky films, no one else until right now had anyone else ever written one. At first, I think understandably, Stallone was hesitant about a left field idea from two relative newcomers, and then Stallone got a chance to see the film Fruitvale Station, which stars Jordan and was written by Coogler, an unflinching look at the final days of a real man, Oscar Grant, who was killed in 2009 by BART officers, unarmed and handcuffed face down on the cold concrete of a subway station. Ryan was tackling important subjects that the American people deserve to be educated on. Maybe there was more to the pitch that Stallone had initially been a little bit lukewarm on. He reconsidered Ryan and Aaron's idea, which is when MGM came on board and said, okay, let's do this. Everything in this film comes from a very real place. It has the story any good sequel has. Someone had an idea to take this in a new direction and they didn't stop when the waters got rough. They persevered, you know, a Rocky story, which is all 100% nestled up all cozy beside the point because Ryan Coogler is also a tactical master working with one of the most gifted physical actors of our generation, which isn't saying shit about the fact that Michael can also maintain your eye when the movie isn't running a conveyor belt of punches on the nearest pugilist. Can we talk about Adonis's first fight? It's all one shot. And there's a few things to keep in mind here because this is astonishing. And yes, obviously I'm aware that this is spliced together for multiple takes, which is missing the point altogether. This still had to be designed, broken down, and executed. You still have to find the actors that can maintain a tempo for a fight that takes place in real time for almost three rounds. The actors get bruised. Clever, practical, and digital effects have to be considered like a magic trick when designing something like this. You have to wave the hand over here and reveal the thing over here. Sure, it feels effortless, but that's why it's so good. It's a masterclass, and it's only Ryan's second movie. Really got my eye on you, third movie. And to dive deeper on our father-son story, I haven't yet talked about. I fight, you fight. When it comes down to it, that's all the movie is about. I fight, you fight. Yes, I know it's unbelievably tired to illustrate the majesty of a boxing movie on the wings of a boxing metaphor, but this film has a right cross that lands with the combined mass of a thousand imploding suns every single time I watch it. Right as these two people devoid mostly of familial connection as they'd long died off, right as they seem to be forming a real bond with each other, Rocky gets diagnosed with cancer. And for what seems like the first time in his entire life, Rocky doesn't have any fight left. He just sort of reckons that it's time to go. And that, as a sentiment, is as inarguable for a man that has ruined his body over years and years of fighting. Every day is agony, and all the people that cared about him are long gone. And like two masculine idiots who can't talk about their feelings because they punch sweaty men for a living, they say horrible, horrible things to each other. Dodge having even the scab shavings of an actual human emotion, choosing instead to live up to the idea that they're just beef with legs. Rocky tells Donnie that he's not family. It was just a thing they were doing for fun, and Rocky is not exactly a Harvard professor of clinical psychology, so a lot of his emotion is pretty easy to read here. He's still trying to protect Adonis, which causes our titular protagonist to react with blind rage and fury, and he does it in such a way that maximizes collateral damage to Bianca, which is, I mean, it's a really bad look in a lot of ways. When their cooler heads prevail and tell them what they already knew, that they're family, and they're gonna help each other. I fight 
You fight a lot of Rocky's trepidation with chemo that at first he flatly refuses to go through is born from the time he spent with Adrian before she died. The chemo wasn't effective, so he saw his wife tortured before she was taken away. Because cancer isn't fair, and life isn't fair, and the world isn't fair. I'll fight your demons. You fight mine. I fight you fight. Adonis is there for all of it, much to the protest of Rocky. They train with the time they have to do so, but life is important. Family is important. Rocky gave Adonis a lot more than just boxing tips. They both know it. It's a wonderful portrait of a non-standard father-son relationship that is tested in some incredibly serious ways. You know, one of those. Rocky's fight in this movie is against his own body because the fighter that could stand up to all that punishment is on the verge of giving up. In fact, we actually see him give up and decide that he's just gonna rough it for a few months and then die. But Adonis is like, Hey, idiot, you know you're Rocky Balboa, right? And then Rocky fires back, Oh, snap, I forgot, my bad, I was wrong. I do have a family, and that family is you. Whoops, my bad, maybe I should be alive more often. <sniffs> Got it. But that isn't the kicker. Rocky just jumped back into the ring after a lot of hardship to train Creed Bond Jr., and that took a lot out of him. So if he's gonna fight against cancer and go through the hell of chemotherapy, a fight that legitimately scares him for perfectly understandable reasons, then Adonis needs to give everything he has to this fight in front of them. A thing devoid of meaning or stakes, the last match of one boxer's career and the second of another. I mean, it's a title fight, but come on. It inherits meaning. Boxing doesn't have to matter to you, but it is the only thing that Rocky has ever known, and he wants to know that all of this effort, all of his effort, all of this sacrifice had meaning, that he put his trust in the right person. I fight. <laughs> We need to talk about what led to this fight. I've skipped over a hell of a lot of plot that has led us to here, the final fight. Adonis may have tried it first to go without the name of Creed across his belt, but when the press got a hold of who he really was, that went right out the window. The decision was made for him. He's Creed, whether he likes it or not now, which means he now has to live up to the name, which does add a shade of weight to our stakes going into the final match. The fun backstory to this is that a big bad boxer is going to jail and he can fit in a final fight before that becomes his reality. The opportunity to fight the son of the most famous boxer that ever lived just came on the market for fights. Rocky is like, yeah, hey, you won one boxing match one time and a top fighter in the world just challenged you. Creed's first and only fight, the one-shotter, only went three rounds. <laughs> I don't want to get into the boxing weeds here, but one of the reasons boxers have to be in immaculate physical shape is because the later rounds become hell on the body. That's why fighters end up in that lover's tussle all the time. It's a moment of rest. Okay, I am going to get into the boxing weeds because that is something that Rocky movies do. The subtlety of the battle is something I always find mesmerizing in these movies. Rocky Balboa is smart about exactly two things in the whole world, boxing and love. If you need one of those two things, he is your dude. And Rocky knows that Creed is not ready to do this. I mean, they, they both do, but sometimes crazy opportunities come along you never expected, so part of it is just like, eh, what the hell. Of course, keeping in the back of our minds that this is literally the exact sword match that killed his dad, but okay. Creed cannot win on technical skill. This isn't even one of the possible miracles, like just having an innate talent for punching stuff. These fighters train and train and train to operate at their most efficient peak physical shape to maintain energy the longest while sustaining as little damage as they can. So Rocky is like, He has a reach on you. Definitely has a lot more experience than you. I'm faster than you are. And since he's the champion, you got to bring the fight to him. You got to go to the body, dig. And in doing that, you're in a very dangerous place because you can get laid out. Stay at medium range through the fight. Just stay right up on him and just hit the crap out of him. The in the corner. Body, body. Creed's superpower is that he got his dad's insanely powerful arm cannons. Of winnable options, that is the best bet to tire out the opponent or at least hit him enough to win on points. Maybe he'll score a freak haymaker and knock the dude out. Who knows? It's a low chance, but it is a chance. That's why they go with it. This, of course, has a setback because maintaining that close distance for the match puts Creed at a very convenient punching distance from, as we learned, the top fighter in the world. But by the time the fight actually comes up, we've been through so much with these people that we need Creed to stand up and say, I 
am. And this is a scary fight. He gets his ass kicked. He gets his ass kicked so bad that he literally gets knocked out. <laughs> Which is when the movie takes that time to remind you that this is a Rocky movie and it's gonna punch your emotions in the behind. But what the movie didn't push at this point was this. Rocky was one of the great American movies because it showed you what hard work can get you and what you're willing to risk to get there. He just wants to be heard and stand on his own, if anything. The final fight is less about the other fighter and is more of a stand-in for his own dad which they told us right at the beginning of the movie. In the scene where Adonis is shadow boxing with one of his dad's old fights, he stands in for Rocky so he can fight his dad. He even got knocked out and had the wherewithal to get up before he was counted out. I gotta prove it. Prove what? I'm not a mistake. And as he comes to, it's not looking great, and then Rocky jumps in and does the big trainer speech thing, riling us up for the last round. I talked about this particular trope in the Stranger Things episode. It's when you know that a piece of entertainment has had something in its back pocket this whole time and never used it. Because up to this point, they haven't actually used the Rocky theme in the movie. They saved it for the perfect moment to do so. Go get it, son. It's perfect. It plays after we know we already lost, and they finish big. Just a flurry of punches flying off like a thunderstorm. Like, boxing, for as much as Hollywood makes it about heart, is really about your ability to operate your body like a fine machine better than your opponent can, who happens to be hitting you. Quick PSA, getting hit makes you tired faster. The way this resolves is actually a miracle. In the end, he loses. We knew he was gonna lose, and, and no one cares. He needed to show up and he showed up. But by putting on a show, he not only fills his promise to his uncle, but earns his surname in the process. I fight, you fight. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please, please, please sub to the channel so I can start hanging stamped precious metals on my wall. Damien Eggleton probably did not have the greatest time in school when The Omen came out, if you were old enough for when that happened. Amy B. The extra B stands for Balaniferous, which means acorn bearing. I'm glad I could teach you that. Chris Cable is now known as Chris Cabal. Like the comic book Mur Murder Boy? Okay. Silly, funny name. Ha ha. This name is like Patreon art, like, but post YouTube. Reminds me of the earlier Damien Eggleton works, actually. Douglas Doucette for mayor of your heart. It's die hard for a new generation. Kale harder. You're gonna hit that kale and you're gonna hit it hard. Vitamin G's name is almost impossible to say without immediately shouting the word UNIT! Like, how? how? It's Vitamin G UNIT! Charles Barker, shut up and jam! Lizard is a wizard. Matt Charles, welcome to the League of Extraordinary People with two first names. That's Franklin Bob over there behind old Percy Peter. Oh, Glenn Sawyer, so pleased you could join us and our new friend Matt Charles at the League of... Tom Sosick, the voice of news you trust. <clears throat> I don't know like a bottle something. <laughs> Adam Thomas, Matt and Glenn are in the other room waiting for you in the lead. Okay, I'll, st I'll stop. Chris Chambers of Secrets. I'm sure every, every single person who has done this has tried to make that joke. Garrett Lathy. Garrett Lathy goes undercover to tell you why Lunchables could be killing your household turtles tonight at 11. That will do it for us. Thank you so much. Please vote in the comments for your pick for the next episode of Movies and Mikey, and I will see you 
next time. I'm gonna try to pick my clip back up after packs. Here we go. Toot toot. Train noises.